Today on Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy, we're learning about our place in God's family. The Bible tells us that the church is the blood-bought, blood-washed family of God. Singles, divorced, parents, families who know Jesus Christ. There's only one category. We shouldn't look at each other in any other way than that's my brother and that's my sister who do the will of God. Church needs to be found. Welcome to Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy, pastor of Kindred Community Church in Anaheim Hills, California. Well, family is the core of society. It's the God-given foundation for our schools and businesses in small towns and large cities. But as we'll hear today, when we become followers of Christ, the word family expands beyond our biological mother and father and brother and sister. It includes everyone who does the will of God. We're continuing our series in the Gospel of Mark with a message titled, Family Ties. Here's Pastor Philip. J.C. Ryle, the great bishop of Liverpool, says in his commentary in Mark's gospel, it's interesting to mark the quiet, firm perseverance of our Lord in the face of all his discouragements. None of these things moved him. The slanderous suggestion of enemies and the well-meant remonstrances of ignorant friends and family were alike powerless to turn him from his course. He had set his face as a flint towards the cross and the crown. He knew the work that he had to do in the world. He had a baptism to be baptized with and was straightened till it was accomplished. Luke 12, verse 15. That's a good word. I mean, friends, family, foe. But there he is in the midst of this house. There's a crowd. It starts on the outside. Person to person comes right to where Jesus is. Hey, do you realize your family's outside? They want to see you doesn't flinch, doesn't knock him off his game. Let me tell you who my family is. You're my mother, and you're my brother, and you're my sister if you do the will of God. I'm doing the will of God, now let's keep talking about it. And there's nothing in the text that tells us that he immediately invited his family in. As this question is raised, Jesus raises a question, who is my mother and my brothers, verse 33? And they said, that's the people the crowd said, hey, your family is here looking you. But his answer is, no, my family's here listening to me. Jesus pivots from this question concerning his natural biological family to talk about a new and spiritual family. Here are my mother and my brothers who do the will of God. That's the point not to be missed. There's a greater, there's a stronger relationship that trumps the family and any other earthly relationship. You and I, when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, are placed into a community of people marked by a desire to do God's will. Now, we could get off on that. Generally speaking, the will of God is the Word of God. In fact, if you cross-reference into Luke's account of this story, in Luke chapter 8, verse 21, Jesus doesn't say, my brother is he who does the will of God, as he says here in Mark. Luke tells us, he says, my brother is he who hears my word and does it. Jesus is saying that the priority relationship is the family of God. There's no avoiding that. His mother, his half-brothers are outside. And he's admitting there's a relationship that's far more important than that, so much so that he leaves them outside and identifies the spiritual family made up of those who have obeyed. And I want to remind us of that. In no way, and Jesus doesn't do this, is Jesus repudiating his own family. Jesus isn't saying that family isn't important. He's just saying it's not of first importance. He said, Pastor, really? Yeah, that's what I mean. That's what the tax means. The tax means that. Your family's important, but it's not the first relationship of importance. Let me enforce this. Jesus had two brothers. Did you notice we saw four of them in Mark 6, 3? Let me pick two, James and Jude. Does that ring a bell towards the end of the Bible? 
There's two books, James and Jude. We believe that was written by the half-brothers of the Lord Jesus. Here's how Jude and James begin. This is James, the half-brother of the Lord Jesus who grew up with him. Is that how James begins? No. Jude doesn't begin. This is Jude, the half-brother of the Lord Jesus. I got to live with him for about 25 years. You know how it begins, both of them? This is James and Jude, the servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. The half-brothers of Jesus defined their relationship with him in spiritual terms. Why? Because they got the message that day. Those that do the will of God are my brothers and my sisters and my mother and my family. Powerful. Let me give you a couple of implications from this whole thought. Number one, it should remind us that the church is to be a family. That's the first thing I get from this. Jesus is saying, You who do the will of God, you who obey the gospel, you who follow me, you're my family. In fact, that motif of family is used throughout the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verse 1, chapter 2, verse 19, chapter 3, verse 15. There's no autonomy in the Christian life. Let me define the Christian life for you. The Christian life is church life. Can I say that again? The Christian life is church life. You cannot find a believer in the New Testament in isolation from the church. There's no autonomous Christians. There's no one little family or a couple of little families over here, and they're a church to themselves. It's not the Bible. No, the Bible tells us that the church is the blood-bought, blood-washed family of God. Singles, divorced, parents, families who know Jesus Christ. There's only one category. According to Galatians 3.28, there's no male, no female, no Gentile, no Jew, no servant, and no free man. There's only one category in the church. We shouldn't look at each other in any other way than that's my brother and that's my sister who do the will of God. Nothing should divide us. No category should be used to pigeonhole believers or to divide believers. Jesus would abhor that. He points to a circle of Different people and say, you're my brother, you're my sister, you're my mother, you who do the will of God. Church needs to be family. Families spend time together. Families take on likeness of each other, and we take on the likeness of Christ. Commitment in family. There's provision and support and love in family. There's instruction and counsel in family. There's discipline. One finds one's identity in the family. That was the thing that struck me about my own conversion, I grew up in a Christian home, but I didn't become a believer until I was 16. In fact, for a good period of my teenage years, I wasn't a rebel, but I couldn't wait to kind of get out of the house and go and enjoy the world without my father looking over my shoulder. And God goes and saves me at age 16 and blows that whole plan up. And I'm in a little Baptist church most of my life, you know, and the worship's, you know, slow, and the woman playing the organs, you know, everybody sitting in shirts and ties. I mean, I got dressed up for Sunday, but usually on a Saturday, I was in jeans, a pair of DM boots, and off to a soccer game and a bit of a skinhead going. I, I just didn't look that well on a Sunday morning in a suit and tie. I didn't jive with who I was on a Saturday, but that's because my heart loved what I did on a Saturday and didn't like what I was forced to do on a Sunday until I get saved. See, up until that point, when I walked down the street where the church was with my father, I called it the walk of shame. I lived in literal fear of any of my friends seeing me. I mean, I'd just been with them on a Saturday and up to no good, to be honest about it. And then I'm going down to church on a Sunday morning. I lived in absolute fear of it. And for many years, I got away with it because most of them were hung over or weren't out of their beds by the time I was heading down to church. So that was one benefit. Then I'd get saved. And before I knew it, I'm falling in love with these people. And I can't wait to be at church. And the next thing, I'm out in public with my father, with these older men, with their bullhorns, telling people to get saved. And I stood there in that circle until my chance came where I was given the bullhorn and I had my opportunity to talk about getting saved. And the day did come when some of my friends came walking by. But there was such a change in my heart. I was happy to go outside the camp and bear his reproach. Because to borrow the words of Ruth to Naomi, as I looked at my father and those old men, those fuddy duddies, who are a world away from the world I used to live in on a Saturday, to borrow the words of Ruth to Naomi, 
Your God's my God, and your people, my people. And the church became my family. And I think Jesus wants us to see it that way. Secondly, this is where I want to come back and kind of dance carefully, but I might stand on someone's toes. But while this text doesn't call us to dishonor family in any way, Jesus honored family and its importance. He just relegates it in comparison to the spiritual family of God's people. I think Jesus would challenge us to make sure that while we honor the family and hold it up high, we don't worship it. I think there's the possibility of committing what I call domestic idolatry, where we worship the family and everything about it. It defines our life, and our view of the family defines our opinion of other people, even within the family of God. I think that's a pendulum that has swung too far. I've seen it where family commitment competes with church commitment, where the physical family with the spiritual family, where we invert this. I'm so glad today that we're seeing a resurgence, I want to say that, of commitment to the home. And I marvel at the young couples and young families of our church, and I'm so thankful that they're serious about family life. But I do want to put a warning out there. Don't make an idol of your family or your children or your marriage. Make sure that the family of God and those who love the Lord Jesus are your real family, the priority. I'll call it the hyper-family movement. It's kind of emerged in the last decade or so. And there are good things to it, but I think there are bad things to it. I think there are things that have got out of imbalance because I've watched it and I've listened to the advocates of it and I've watched some that are attached to it. And it seems to me that church becomes secondary in this world. It seems to me that often these families become a little church unto themselves where because the church isn't pure enough for them, three or four families will get together and they'll become their own church and the fathers of those families will be self-appointed pastors. I'm not sure about that at all. I think it's an indulgent love for the family that produces that. Some of their children are then pulled out of the company of other children who belong to families that do the will of God and love them. And instead of encouraging that, we build walls and categories and divide over family issues and family perspectives and family choices within the family of God. Dangerous and disobedient in the light of this passage. I've seen elders and churches not given their place as you have this exaggerated priestly role of the father held up in competition to church authority and biblical leadership, which indeed comes alongside a family and indeed is over that family. Children are given communion. I've even tried to think through the benefits and the downsides to the family integrated model. I've read several books on it, and I don't particularly like it. Let me tell you why, just fundamentally, because unless I've misunderstood it, it's kind of the family becomes the building block for the integrated church family. And so even the small groups are usually a nuclear family and the single person or the divorced person is put into that group because in some way they're not part of a family, they need to be with a family. I'm simplifying it, maybe I've missed it, so if I have, you can tell me. But it seems to me in that model, the church conforms to the family, the family unit. Jesus doesn't teach that. Jesus said that single person is part of my family. He who does the will of God, that's my brother and my sister. That's the only criteria. Not that you're married and have 2.5 kids and you've got that all working together, so you're the building block for the church. Where do we ever come up with that idea? Jesus says, hey, if you do the will of God, you're my brother, you're my mother, you're my father. So you can think that out. You can unbuckle your belt, the bumpy ride's over. You can think about it. But some of that concerns me greatly, and I keep my eye on it as a pastor. I want to respect choices, but Jesus seems to warn us here not to allow a love for the nuclear family to get in the way of church unity and the priority of the family of God. Maybe the third application would be this. If doing the will of God costs your family something, or triggers conflict with your family, do the will of God. 
That would seem to be one of the implications here. Jesus talks about it. I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. I come to put differences between fathers and sons and mothers and daughters and mother-in-laws and daughter-in-laws. If you're going to do the will of God, which you and I want to do, that's the mark of the true believer. It doesn't establish our relationship with God, but it gives evidence of it because 1 John 2.17, he who does the will of God abides forever. So it's important. And as you and I fulfill God's will, it might bring us into conflict with the will of parents, the will of children, the will of potential spices, or the will of a spice. And at that point, Jesus seems to be saying, God's family and God's will reigns supreme. Jesus said, those in his family will do the will of God first and foremost. Talk to a Jew in Israel who's come to Christ, and they will verify that. Talk to a Catholic in Mexico or Ireland or Italy who's come to Christ, and they will verify that. Talk to a Muslim in Iran, they'll verify it. Talk to a Hindu in India, they'll verify it. That God's will and their family's design and desires are often in conflict. And at that point, some of these precious saints, it's a world from us in many ways, have lost mothers and fathers. Inheritances have been kicked out of their house. My friend Alan Graham found his clothes in the front yard, but he grabbed them with a broken heart and realized, hey, at this point, it's Jesus or them. And he that does the will of God is the brother to Jesus, part of the family of God, which is the supreme family, because there will be only one family in heaven, and there'll be no marriage and nuclear families in heaven. And our marriages are just about pointing to the gospel fundamentally, and the forever marriage between Christ and his church. Maybe in a lesser capacity, we had to go through this when we decided to come to the Master's Seminary in 1994. That wasn't an easy decision. We were in a ministry. We had our three daughters, five, three, and one. But we sensed a call to come out to the Master's Seminary and be retrained and retooled for a lifetime of ministry. And that was tough for our parents. In fact, it would trigger a series of events where June's brother would follow us to America. So within the space of one year, June's mom and dad would lose six of their grandchildren. And they were at a place in life where they were looking forward to that. They were on the verge of retirement. Things were good. They were looking forward to weekends with the grandchildren and giving them back. It's the best thing. It's perfect. What an arrangement. And then, boom, boom. You're what? Yeah, we're thinking of going to America. Are you sure? You've got a good ministry here. Doors are opening here. Yeah, but we believe this is God's will. And it came to that point where we left for America. It was a horrible day. I remember June's mom and dad came over from Scotland. The atmosphere in our home was very close to a funeral atmosphere. We could hardly look at each other without being on the verge of tears. Everybody knew there was a few hours to come and then the big farewell. And we got down to the airport and there was tears. Remember June and I going down onto the gangway under there? I couldn't look back. I just couldn't do it. June was looking back and crying. Everybody up in the facility were crying. June got onto the aircraft for the first 30 minutes. She wept the whole way to, to London. So much so that a business guy sitting beside her said, this isn't a long journey. Don't worry about it. He had no idea what was going on. I remember that day, mind you, playing the trump card and saying, but look, guys, I know this is hard, but didn't you teach us to be like this? Huh. Didn't you teach us to love Jesus more than anything? So much so that while it rips the heart out of us, we're going to rip the grandchildren from your arms because this is God's will. And this is about the church, and this is about the kingdom of God. And if this is the only price we have to pay... And they've come to realize that's sitting, sipping coffee at the swimming pool at our house here in Orange County, you know, three times a year, Hotel California. It's kind of worked out pretty good for those guys in the end. But you get the point. That wasn't easy. That was hard. But, you know, we all had to learn, hey, it's the family that counts. God's family. It's the will of God that counts for our children, even when it comes at a cost to the family as they pursue that one great family, the people of God. Think it out. I think these are stunning and striking words given the culture. I think they do speak 
to a good trend gone bad in some ways within the church regarding the family. Elevate it, but don't worship it. Don't let your family commitments get in the way of your family's need to commit to this family and the families of this family, all of them, not just those you're comfortable with or those that are just part of your group of families. This knocks that all on the head and reminds us one category, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that we might hear the challenge and the revolutionary nature of this text that certainly doesn't undermine the importance of family, but elevates the supreme importance of the church, reminding us that whatever our relationships in life are and may be through blood, through business, they are secondary to the family of God made up of those who do the will of God. And so, Lord, help us each to be challenged in whatever way necessary, whether you're asking some of us to go far to commit the missions and ministry to a point where it's going to upset children, disappoint parents, bring conflict. But, oh, God, your will be done. Help us to take our family life seriously. But I pray that our families and our commitment to our families and the choices that families make will not become issues of division between those who are true brothers and sisters in Christ the greatest relationship and the most important. Lord, we take that final challenge. Help us to be consistent, constant. We marvel at the Lord Jesus and how he just picked up and went on. Lord, help us to find a second wind. Help us to take that second step on the path to obedience and costly discipleship. For Jesus' sake, amen. Amen. You're listening to Know the Truth and the conclusion of a message called Family Ties. If you miss any portion of this teaching, you can listen online at ktt.org or download our podcast from any podcast app like Spotify, Apple, or Google. Easily download, listen, and share with your friends and family so they can grow in their faith too. Regular listeners know that we're not afraid to address difficult topics on this program. If it's in God's Word, sooner or later we'll be talking about it. And you'll hear a perspective that is thoroughly biblical and completely practical. Maybe that's why you keep tuning into this program. Your life is being changed and transformed as you encounter God's Word on these daily broadcasts. And as a listener-supported ministry, we wouldn't exist without your generous and faithful support. So if you are benefiting from Philip's bold Bible teaching, please give a financial gift today. Or if you'd like to take your giving to the next level, join our growing family of Truth Ambassadors. A truth ambassador is someone who gives on a monthly basis, ensuring that we can meet our ongoing financial needs like purchasing airtime and running our website. When you give today, you'll receive an intriguing book called Global Reset. Do current events point to the Antichrist and his worldwide empire? This book will help you prepare yourself spiritually and arm yourself with information and also find answers to the questions everyone should be asking about current world events. Request this eye-opening resource when you call 888-644-8811 or give online at ktt.org. You can also mail your donation to Know the Truth, Post Office Box 30250, Anaheim Hills, California, 92809. Now, maybe you're new to Know the Truth and you're still figuring us out. Well, we have a welcome gift for you. It's a refreshing devotional booklet from Pastor Philip titled, Resting in God's Daily Sufficiency. And it's sure to bless your devotional times. Read it and then pass it along to a friend. Learn more and request your copy online at ktt.org. I'm Wayne Shepherd. Join us again next time for another bold biblical message next week on Know the Truth. Today's program was produced and sponsored by Know the Truth Incorporated. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Mm